previously we have uh, seen line codes and uh, we've also done a, a derivation or a or an analysis of the minimum transmission bandwidth and uh, we saw that the minimum transmission bandwidth minimum transmission bandwidth which we denote as bt it should be at least half the symbol rate when we are using rectangular pulses okay and uh, we've done this for the case of rectangular pulses in the previous video and uh, we've uh, also derived what is the minimum transmission bandwidth for MRE transmission and uh, that gave us the transmission bandwidth should be at least n times w by logarithm to the base to m right this is in general for MRE transmission the second equation here gives us a relationship between the transmission bandwidth which is BT so that's the transmission bandwidth and W is the signal bandwidth that we are wanting to transmit the bandwidth of the signal that we are interested in transmitting okay M is the MRE transmission that we are going to use it can it is a power of 2 so it can be binary in which case M is equal to 2 or 4 re 8 re so m can have uh, values 4 8 16 32 and so on n is the number of bits per sample in the quantization process number of bits per sample that we use in the quantization process so that's n and that is equal to logarithm to the base to l where l is the number of quantization levels where l is the number of quantization levels today we are going to do an example on um, computing the transmission bandwidth and we will see uh, what happens uh, when we are transmitting at a certain uh, rate or speed uh, how the bandwidth requirement changes when we change the value of m right and uh, I also need to describe here what is RS RS is the symbol rate also called as the baud rate the symbol rate is equal to the bit rate only for the binary case right so RS is equal to rb divided by logarithm to the base to m again we have seen this in the previous uh, lecture so rs the symbol rate or the baud rate is equal to the bit rate divided to the divided by the logarithm to the base to m and uh, when m is equal to 2 when m is equal to 2 then we get rs is equal to rb the bit rate or the baud rate and the bit rate become identical because one symbol is equal to one bit when m is equal to two for binary transmission each bit represents a symbol but for uh, higher values of m for for example for four array transmission each symbol is two bits in the case of eight array each symbol is three bits and so on so when we are having binary transmission the symbol rate is equal to the bit rate and vice versa so let us now have a, a workout or an example problem where we will see how the transmission bandwidth requirement changes as we uh, change the value of m and we will see how we how it can benefit uh, in a communication system or how it can be utilized in a communication system by choosing appropriate values of M and uh, controlling the transmission bandwidth required for communication. So we have our example here which is uh, or it states that an, uh, a signal which is sampled at 8000 samples per second and quantized using 16 quantization levels and we are asked to find uh, what is the minimum transmission bandwidth required when uh, 
such a digital signal is uh, transmitted using binary pulses and with eight array pulses that is when m is equal to 8 and 16 okay basically we are asked to find the transmission bandwidth uh, for different values of m and uh, whenever you see the word binary you should uh, automatically uh, instantly re realize and recognize that uh, that corresponds to m is equal to 2 binary means m equal to 2 okay sometimes the value of m will not be specified but uh, when you see the word binary it means m equal to 2 so let's try to find out what would be the uh, transmission bandwidth for each of these cases the first step is we will need to find out what is the source bit rate so bit rate rb is equal to n times fs okay fs the sampling rate has been given to us in the question n the number of bits per sample is given indirectly through l so we can first uh, compute n n is equal to logarithm to the base 2 l which is equal to logarithm to the base 2 16 so that's equal to 4 so therefore our bit rate rb is going to be equal to uh, 4 times fs which is 8000 so that corresponds to 64000 bits per second or we can write that as 64 kilobits per second so that's our source bit rate which is uh, 4 into 8000 okay just a quick thing there. Uh, it's 4 into 8,000 is 32,000, right? Uh, okay, 32,000. Or we can write that as 32 kbps. Okay, so that's our uh, source bit rate. Now, from the source bit rate, we can now proceed with computing the transmission bandwidth. And we'll start with the first case, which is the binary case so case a for binary transmission binary means m is equal to 2 so in the case of binary we need to find the symbol rate because the transmission bandwidth depends on the symbol rate or the baud rate, right, RS. So the transmission bandwidth, the minimum transmission bandwidth is uh, half the baud rate. And uh, for M equal to 2, RS is equal to RB. We've seen that earlier. So therefore, the minimum transmission bandwidth in the case of uh, binary becomes... Uh, 32,000 by 2 so that means the minimum transmission bandwidth BT is 16,000 Hertz okay uh, the bandwidth the unit for bandwidth is Hertz it's the uh, frequency band required so the unit for bandwidth is Hertz so for the binary case we have got the minimum transmission bandwidth to be 16,000 hertz when we are wanting to transmit 32,000 32, bits per second and if we use uh, binary transmission binary pulses then we need a bandwidth of at least 16 kilohertz that is now let's see what happens when we have m equal to 8 which is the second case so for m equal to 8 the symbol rate rs is equal to rb by logarithm to the base 2 m and that's 8 m is equal to 8 here so that would give us 32000 by 3 logarithm to the base 2 8 is 3 so we will get the Uh, symbol rate to be 32,000 by 3 
and from that we will now compute the transmission bandwidth bt that should be at least half the symbol rate that's rs by 2 so in place of rs we are going to substitute uh, this value in place of rs because that's rs so that means the transmission bandwidth should be at least that's rs by 2 right so that will be uh, 16,000 by 3 that works out to so the transmission bandwidth the minimum transmission bandwidth should be 5333.33 hertz okay so when we use m equal to 8 to transmit 32,000 bits per second because that's our bit rate right we computed the bit rate here that is 32,000 bits per second and if you want to transmit at that rate with binary transmission we need a bandwidth of 16,000 hertz on the communication channel and if you use m is equal to 8 then the required bandwidth goes down from 16,000 to 5,333 so it goes down by a factor of 3 because the symbol rate has, has gone down by a factor of 3 in this case. So you see that the transmission bandwidth is decreasing when we use higher value of M. So let's do the third case for M equal to 16 now. So for M equal to 16, again, the symbol rate RS is rb by log 2m which is 32,000 by logarithm to the base 2 16 which is 32,000 by 4 so that will give us 8,000 symbols per second symbols per second so that's our symbol rate or baud rate and from that we can now compute our transmission bandwidth bt as at least rs by 2 so which implies that the transmission bandwidth should be at least uh, 8000 by 2 right 8000 by 2 that makes it at least 4000 so the transmission bandwidth should be at least 4000 hertz so uh, we see here that by increasing the value of m right by using more voltage levels in representing our symbols we are able to reduce the required transmission bandwidth for communication at the same uh, level of the bit rate so the bit rate in all these three examples is 32,000 bits per second so if you are transmitting uh, using MRE transmission with m equal to 16 and sending 8,000 symbols per second then we will have uh, we will still have 32,000 bits per second but using a bandwidth of only 4,000 hertz with m equal to 8 to achieve the same 32 kilobits per second we need a bandwidth of 5333.33 hertz and for the binary case to transmit at the same speed we need a much higher bandwidth which is 16000 hertz at least right so the observation here is that by increasing the value of m we can reduce the required bandwidth for communication at a certain speed or at a certain bit rate but uh, it seems good that you know we can simply increase the value of m and save bandwidth but uh, it has its own problems increasing the value of m means we are having more and more voltage levels that means for a given peak to peak range of this of the uh, signal or for a given peak to peak range limitation the separation between the voltage levels will become smaller and smaller and therefore the effect of noise will become more uh, stronger the the noise will affect the signal uh, 
in a in a in a in a, in a stronger way in the sense that the uh, bit error rate will increase so just to give you an indication so when m is equal to 2 we are using only two voltage levels so we have say one voltage level there and another voltage level there so, and suppose that's our peak to peak range right now when m is equal to 8 that same peak to peak range is divided into eight voltage levels that means we have say a voltage level a voltage level here and another voltage level here and maybe the next one is here and here and here and so on right so we will have eight possible voltage levels i've shown only a few here so let's say that's one two three four five six let's say that's seven and another one here eight so i just made eight different levels here so that's one level that's another level and so on right so when we have multiple voltage levels what you notice is the separation between the voltage levels which was quite large earlier that has become very small now when we increase m for a given peak to peak range for a given peak to peak range the separation between the voltage levels becomes very small uh, becomes smaller and smaller as we increase the value of m and that means when noise gets added to the signal right so the effect of noise becomes more severe so in the binary case even such a huge such a big amount of noise was not going to cause us much problems because the voltage levels are still further apart than the level of the noise but if a similar kind of noise affected uh, this particular signal then it would become difficult to identify whether this component or this part of the signal is belonging to uh, this voltage level or this voltage level right so the effect of noise becomes more severe and it would lead to increase in the number of uh, errors in the received signal so uh, it looks good in terms of uh, uh, efficient efficient utilization of the bandwidth or to reduce the bandwidth uh, requirement to increase m but the cost we have to pay for that is increased bit errors okay so that's the observation that we'll make here so increasing m reduces the required bandwidth but increases the bit error probability okay so there is a trade-off here we cannot increase m as we like if we do increase m then the effect of noise will be will be more severe and the errors will increase so we'll have to do other techniques for detecting and correcting those errors as well right so that would increase uh, the complexity of the system but uh, nonetheless all these are part of a digital communication system we use MRE transmission uh, of course there are going to be errors uh, in the received stream and uh, we have to detect where those errors have occurred and then correct those errors and if those errors cannot be corrected then we have to use some other mechanism to recover those bits so all of this is part of a digital communication system and uh, we will be studying some of those topics in uh, in subsequent lectures but obviously this course does not intend to cover all of the topics related to uh, digital communication but we will cover some of the important ones next what we are going to do is we will see another uh, technique in uh, in analog to digital conversion wherein we want to keep the quantization uh, noise as small as possible right uh, we've discussed this during the uh, topic of quantization that quantization introduces error uh, 
which uh, which is non reversible once introduced the contradiction error cannot be removed and therefore it is uh, pertinent that uh, we keep the quantization error as small as possible in the first place right so we'll see one uh, a couple of techniques but we will uh, talk about only one of the techniques in, in this video and the other technique we'll talk about it in the next video and that is called as uh, differential pulse code modulation we will see what is differential pulse code modulation now and then uh, we'll see how you know what is the principle behind it and uh, how it can reduce the quantization error differential pulse, pulse code modulation or dpcm as it is abbreviated uh, exploits the fact that when the sampling rate fs is large enough the successive samples have uh, quite similar values that means they have a high degree of correlation so let us see from this diagram what we mean by that statement so when we have the sampling rate which is uh, shown to be here so there's a sample these red dots are representing the samples but if we increase the sampling rate further and let's say we added extra samples over here and here and here and so on then we would have those additional samples somewhere here and here and here as well so when the sampling rate is increased then the successive samples the samples which are next to each other have a high degree of similarity in terms of the values right they have a high degree of correlation technically we call that successive samples have a high degree of correlation or similarity in the values see the, the the values are going to be close uh, quite close to each other so if this was say 3.2 uh, then this is going to be say 3.23 3.24 3.21 3 so you see that when the samples are quite close to each other their values are going to be quite similar uh, most of the times except when the signal is having a high slope like this when the signal is having a, a, a steep slope going in you know if you, that means it has a vertical uh, transition either from the top to the bottom or from the bottom to the top when the slope of the signal is high then the uh, difference between the values of adjacent samples could be high but uh, for the most part of the signal uh, as long as the sampling rate is high enough then the neighboring sub sim uh, neighboring samples would have values which are quite similar to each other and differential pulse code modulation exploits this fact so in order to reduce the quantization error uh, in the quantization process and the way it does it is by predicting the future samples based on the information of the previous sample so if we know that a particular sample is having a value of 3.2 for example it looks like here 3.2 then uh, the corresponding uh, the next sample would have a value which is very close to 3.2 now the process of predicting the next sample value that is beyond the scope of this course so we just say it's a predictor which is an accurate predictor that gives us a prediction predictive predicted value that is an accurate uh, representation of the actual sample value but the uh, uh, but the method or the procedures involved in the prediction process are are an advanced uh, adaptive signal processing uh, topic and that is beyond the scope of this uh, course so we will just say that we have a block called predictor that would predict and give us the predicted values now assuming that this predictor is a good predictor in the sense that it is predicting a value that is very accurate or very close to the actual value that means the difference between the actual value and the predicted value is going to be small so in dpcm what happens is in dpcm the fact that successive samples have a high degree of correlation is utilized uh, to predict the samples so the sample values are predicted 
All right. And uh, if the predictor is good, which is usually the case, we design a predictor which is quite accurate. So if the predictor is good, then the difference between the actual sample value and its predicted value is going to be small. Now, in DPCM, what we do is, rather than quantizing the actual signal, we will be quantizing the difference signal. That is the difference between the actual and the predicted values. We would plot that as a waveform and then quantize this difference signal rather than this actual signal. So because the difference between each of these uh, uh, each of the actual sample values and the predicted values is going to be very small that means the peak to peak range of the difference signal would be much smaller as compared to the peak to peak range of the actual signal so when we have a smaller peak to peak range and if we use the same number of quantization levels for the smaller peak to peak range then the quantization step size would become smaller and therefore the quantization error would become smaller and hence the average quantization noise power would also become smaller because the quantization noise and quantization error depends only on the quantization step size. So we are trying to reduce the quantization step size here by reducing the peak to peak range of the signal that we are going to quantize and we do so by quantizing not the actual signal but the difference signal which comes from the difference between the actual and predicted values uh, predicted by the predictor uh, block. So let's say we have some sample values uh, whose actual values are let's say 5.5 volt, 5.75 volt and 6.2 volt and so on and the corresponding predicted values are let's say 5.52 5.74 and 6.18 and so on right so the actual value uh, is given on the left hand side of this table and the predicted value on the right hand side and the difference between them would be the prediction error so the difference so between 5.52 and 5.5 it is 0 0.02 between 5.74 and 5.75 is minus 0 0.01 and this will be 0 0.02 negative as well right so in this way if you keep on doing it for a large number of samples what you see this even though the actual signal is having voltage levels which are quite large the difference values are always going to be very small numbers that means we can have an actual signal which is say from minus 8 volts for example i'm just using which is having a peak to peak from minus 8 to plus 8 but the difference signal may have a peak to peak range which is going from say minus 0 0.5 to plus 0 0.5 right so now in this case what happens is we see that the difference signal is going to have a much smaller peak to peak range if we plot these values and and make it like a waveform we are going to have some signal which is representing the difference signal uh, we can call it this as d of t while the actual signal is having a much larger peak to peak range which we can call as v of t right so the difference signal is uh, will have a much smaller peak to peak range when the predictor is accurate enough if the predictor that we use is very accurate then this difference signal is going to be uh, 
much much uh, is going to have much smaller peak to peak range and suppose we use say eight quantization levels over here that would have a certain value for delta but if you use the same eight quantization levels for the different signal then the value of delta is going to get smaller so difference signal has smaller peak to peak than actual signal and therefore quantizing the different signal would make the quantization step size delta smaller so if the peak to peak range of the difference signal is smaller by a factor of 10 then the step size would also become smaller by a factor of 10 for the same number of quantization levels so if you use uh, say 8 quantization levels l equal to 8 here and also l equal to 8 here because the peak to peak range is smaller in this case the value of delta would become smaller by the same factor uh, by which the peak to peak range in d of t is smaller as compared to the peak to peak range of the actual signal v of t okay and this is the principle behind the uh, behind differential pulse code modulation or dpcm and uh, let's see how it works by making a block diagram of the dpcm system and then looking at uh, uh, how the uh, blocks interact and how uh, uh, what is the function of each of the blocks in the dpcm system so the important block in the dpcm system is the predictor block whose job is to predict the sample values but uh, rather than simply predicting the sample values itself so let's say rather than just predicting the sample values that is these samples here the predictor goes a step for further by predicting not just the actual sample value but the quantized value of the sample for example each of these samples is going to get quantized to the nearest quantization level which would be for example at 3 right so the predictor not just predicts the actual sample value itself but it predicts the sample value including the quantization error so the job of the predictor is to take some input and give some output and uh, since it's the predicted value of a particular sample we'll call it as m cap of k so the predictor predicts the value of the sample m of k so we distinguish the predicted value with the actual value by putting this uh, hat on top of the uh, notation m m hat of k or m cap of k so that denotes that it is the predicted value of the sample but we could design the predictor to not just predict the sample or the actual sample but to predict the actual sample including the quantization error as well because the actual sample is going to be approximated to the nearest quantization level so we can design the predictor to predict the sample including the quantization error so that gives us uh, the predicted value of the quantized sample value and to denote that it is predicted we put this cap on top and the next thing we do is we compare this predicted value with the actual value and take the difference between them because that would be the error between the actual value and the difference value so we compare it 
with the actual value so suppose we have the actual value here which we denote as m of k so m of k is the sample number k and m q cap of k is the predicted value of sample number k including the quantization error and we take the difference between them so m of k minus m q cap of k that would give us the difference component which we will call as d of k for sample number k the difference between the actual value and the predicted value we denote that as d of k and this d of k is what would go into the quantizer and get quantized So we'll put the quantizer block over here. So that's our quantizer. And at the output of the quantizer, we would have the quantized version, which we will denote as dq of k. And obviously the quantizer introduces some error which is the quantization error so the error in quantization is nothing but the difference between the q of k and d of k all right so that would be the uh, the quantized value right the quantization is performed on the different samples rather than the actual samples itself now in order to predict this what should be the input that goes into the predictor now the input of the predictor should be having some feedback from its output because the predictor should know how good its prediction is so that it can adjust its prediction if its prediction is not good enough and it can get that information from what it has predicted earlier so it can take a feedback from here and give it as part of the input to the predictor and how would the predictor know that this prediction is good or not it would know about that only by knowing the comparison with the actual sample value which is obtained from d of k so we will take the d of uh, the quantized version of d of k and uh, add that to the output of the predictor so the output of the predictor along with the quantized version of dq of k is added together and fed back as input to the predictor so now the predictor is getting some information related to its prediction previously as well as the associated uh, difference between its predicted value and the actual sample value and the error produced by the quantizer also so the d of k gives it an indication of how much is the difference between the output of the predictor and the actual sample and uh, dq of k gives it some information uh, in terms of the quantization error introduced by the quantizer itself so combining these two uh, that that goes as input to the predictor so the predictor has information about its own output as well as the error introduced by the quantizer so based on that the predictor can adapt itself so as to so as to improve its prediction in the subsequent samples so the predictor keeps adapting itself so that the prediction accuracy is as high as possible so that represents the block diagram of the uh, differential pulse code modulation wherein the difference between the actual sample and the predicted sample is quantized and that uh, quantized version of the different signal is what gets transmitted or sent further for processing. So dq of k is what would be used for the transmission purposes, right? Now let's uh, write down some equations based on this uh, block diagram. So the first thing we need to represent is what is this difference signal? The difference signal is the difference between uh, 
the actual sample and the predicted value so we can write that as d of k the different signal or the different sample is equal to the actual sample m of k minus mq cap of k which is the output of the predictor so that gives us d of k and uh, the difference between d of k and dq of k would be the quantization error so the difference between the output of the predictor and the input of the predictor that represents the quantization error which we are going to denote as q of k the quantization error on sample number k is nothing but uh, the difference between the output of the quantizer and the input of the quantizer which is dq of k minus d of k so that gives us the uh, quantization error for each of the samples uh, which we index by the letter k or equivalently we, equivalently we can write the output of the quantizer which is dq of k is equal to the input of the quantizer d of k plus the quantization error q of k right so both these equations are equivalent representations basically uh, it says that the uh, output of the quantizer is having an error component which is denoted as k, the quantization error per, uh, q of k the next thing we are interested in is to uh, represent what is the input of the predictor which is nothing but the feedback coming from its output which is mq of k added to dq of k mq cap of k that is plus dq of k that goes as input to the predictor so the input to the predictor here uh, let me write that input to the predictor is mq cap of k plus dq of k and we are going to simplify that and uh, I represent exactly what this input to the predictor is in a very simpler in a much simpler way so the input to the predictor which is mq cap of k plus dq of k but uh, what is mq cap of k if you go back to the previous slide uh, we can write mq cap of a from this equation as uh, m of k minus d of k right so we can bring this mq cap to the other side and the dk to the right side so we can now write mq cap as m of k minus uh, d of k so that would give us mq cap of k uh, but mq cap of k is equal to m of k minus d of k okay which is evident from the block diagram and uh, we will substitute that uh, in the equation above so m cube cap of k will become m of k minus d of k plus d q of k and now we will combine these uh, dq minus d of k is you've seen here dq minus d of k is nothing but the quantization error q of k so that becomes so that becomes equal to m of k plus dq of k minus d of k which is equal to m of k plus the quantization error q of k which we would simply write as 
m q of k which is nothing but the uh, actual sample value including the quantization error but uh, what we should note here is that the quantization error q of k here uh, is based on quantizing the difference signal which has a much smaller peak to peak range as compared to the actual signal okay so since we are since we are quantizing d of k which has much smaller peak to peak than the actual signal m of k so therefore uh, q of k the quantization error is also smaller as compared to quantizing m of k itself right so the quantization error is going to be much smaller because the uh, quantization step size delta is going to be smaller when we have when we are quantizing the different signal so what we're going to see is when uh, when quantizing d of k when quantizing the different samples d of k rather than the actual samples m of k for the same number of quantization levels which is for the same value of l the step size delta is significantly smaller so therefore the quantization error for a particular sample q of k which would be delta by 2 the maximum value of q of k uh, max would be delta by two half the quantization step size that would be smaller because delta is smaller and that would mean that the quantization noise power nq which is delta square by 12 is also going to be smaller right so that is how the con the, the, the the differential pulse code modulation uh, reduces or minimizes the quantization error and hence the quantization noise power uh, by quantizing the different signal rather than the actual signal itself so that gives us the benefit of reducing the quantization noise power but what we should remember here is that all of this is based on the condition that the predictor is accurate enough to predict the samples correctly that means the difference signal signal should be uh, the difference between the actual sample and the predicted sample value must be very small but sometimes when the signal is having a high slope as suppose in this part of the signal suppose if i mark this part of the signal where the slope of the signal is very high then we could end up in a situation where one sample is here and the next sample is not very uh, is not having a value which is very close to it because the slope is large even at a high sampling rate the next sample value could be here so the difference between these two sample values is much large as compared to this part of the signal where the two neighboring samples have values which are very similar to each other right and in this case the values are 
not so similar if this is say 4.7 then this is like 0 0.6 for example so we see that the the successive samples are not quite similar when the slope of the signal is large when what when we say the slope of the signal is large we mean that the signal has a sharp uh, transition a vertical transition either from the positive to the negative or negative to the positive all right so in that case the successive samples will not have a high degree of correlation and because the predictor is designed based on the assumption that successive samples have a high degree of uh, correlation and that assumption is not uh, true then the predictor will end up predicting values that would create a different signal which is having a much bigger peak to peak that means the difference value will be much larger right so when these differences become large that means the peak to peak range of the different signal would increase and when the peak to peak range of the different signal increases then the advantage of dpcm gets uh, uh, compromised right so that's the cost that's that's the that's the negative side of dpcm in the sense that uh, when the signal slope is high then the predicted values will not be so accurate okay the difference between the actual and the predicted values will become large and in such a situation we will have what is called as uh, slope overload noise uh, which is due to the fact that the slope of the signal is large so the predictor gets overloaded because of the uh, slope of the input signal and is not able to predict accurately and in such a case the the average contradiction noise power would go up uh, as compared to when the correlation between successive samples is high enough right so that's the uh, that's called as slope overload noise we will talk about that in the next video